מקוריות, זה הגביע הקדוש, נכון? בחברה שלנו כולם רוצים להיות מקוריים. איזה דבר מדהים זה, החברות, ההייטק, המחקר, הכל הולך לפי איזה מקורי אתה. ואם אתם רוצים להיות מקוריים במקום העבודה שלכם או בחיים שלכם, אתם חייבים להקשיב טוב למה שאני אומר. הקטע הבא הוא שיחה עם אדם אלתר שחקר את הנושא הזה וכתב ספר שנקרא האנטומיה של פריצת הדרך. ובספר הוא מדבר על הנקודה הזאת שאנחנו לא בכלל מבינים מה פירוש המילה מקוריות. האמת היא בעברית המילה מקוריות מתכוונת בשני מובנים שונים. מקוריות זה לחזור למקור למשהו שכבר היה פעם, או מקוריות זה לעשות משהו חדש שמעולם לא היה. התפיסה הקלאסית זה שמקוריות זה דבר שמעולם לא היה בן אדם מקורי. אבל אדם אלתר אומר משהו אחר. רוב 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 רובם של ההמצאות הם בכלל לא ככה. לקחת משהו שמעולם לא היה ולעשות אותו זה דבר מאוד מאוד קשה. למעשה הוא כל כך קשה שפיטר טיל כתב עליו ספר שנקרא Zero to One, זה מאוד קשה. אבל רוב ההמצאות הן אחרות. ואם אתה יכול לקחת שני, דבר, שני דברים שכבר קיימים ולחבר אותם בצורה מעניינת, זה המקוריות שרוב המחקר באקדמיה הולך אליה, שרוב ההייטק הולך אליה, שאפילו המתמטיקה הולכת אליה. בטח שמעתם שניוטון או לייבניץ פיתחו את החשבון הדיפרנציאלי. אבל זה לא נכון, הם היו מאוד מקוריים, אבל הם בנו על הרבה מאוד דברים שכבר היו קודם. למעשה, אם אנחנו מבינים ורואים מה היה להם כשהם באו לפתח את זה, היה להם כמעט הכל. ואפשר להבין את זה לגבי כמעט כל נושא. הרבה פעמים המצאות שאנחנו חושבים שהן מקוריות בצורה בלתי רגילה, למעשה הן רק עוד אינקרימנט קטן של עבודות שעשו אנשים לפנינו. אז הנה קטע מתוך שיחה עם פרופסור אדם אלתר. Right, so one thing that I really like, uh, that I've always found very useful, and this applies to many, many domains, is that um, humans really prize originality. We like the idea of something being original and new and different. Uh, academia is supposed to be a collection of original ideas. You know, one of the things I was told is you can be a very good student, you can learn everybody else's ideas, and then when, when you're tested on them in an exam, you can churn them out and you can write them down and you'll get an A+. But there's a very different skill when it comes to generating original content. You have to come up with something new that no one's ever come up with before. It's a totally different skill. And one problem with that view is that it fetishizes origin, radical originality, like there's nothing that's ever been like this before. And that is vanishingly rare in the world. Almost nothing is radically original. And I talk about in the book, a lot of examples of this. Like I start by talking about music, that um, if you ask people who was the Western musician, who was the most original musician of the 20th century, and the most common response among other musicians, experts, is Bob Dylan. They say Bob Dylan, no one had the voice like Dylan, you know, he's got this very specific voice, the way he wrote music, was a, he was totally original. And when you read these comments from, from other people, some of them in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, they're saying Dylan was an original, they kept using the term original, there's no one like him. But actually, that's not true. It's just not true at all. It's not true, in fact, when you look at the origins, the roots of Dylan's music, and it's not true when you speak to Dylan himself, who says, oh, I, I combined folk and pop and punk and rock, and I was just sort of an amalgamation of all these ideas. And what I produced was a bit different, but really I was building on these different foundations that had been created elsewhere. And this happens over and over and over again, that we from the outside see something and think this is totally new. So the question is, what should you do? If you're a business person and you want to come up with a new business, trying to find something truly original is almost impossible. But the idea that Dylan and many other successful people use is to recombine old ideas in new ways. So I have this, this journal, this, this list. It's about 20 years old now of good ideas. It's just every good idea that I come across. And if I were ever thinking I want to start a business or I want to do a new research project, I go to this document and I take two random ideas and I say, can they be combined in a way that I've never seen combined before? That recombination approach, taking old things and combining them in new ways, is an incredibly powerful way to make progress when you're stuck in almost any domain. Just a second. Do you have this list online always with you? I, it's on my, it's, it's in Dropbox. It's there. It's sitting there. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not asking you to, you know, share screen, but can you yeah. give me just, just one idea that you consider a good idea? Just one out yeah, of this. Just one. Yeah. It's funny. It's interesting you asked that question. So 
there was an idea I'm, about, I'm an Israeli root. No, 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 no. That's not rude at all. I think that's a great question. So 15 years ago, I came across this product that a student at Harvard had come up with. It's this little clock, alarm clock. It's called Clocky. There's actually a, a business case about it that I used to teach occasionally. It's an alarm clock that in the morning, instead of the alarm going off and you have to hit the sleep button, the alarm clock has wheels. It jumps off your table and it runs around your room. It's, a lot of people know about this product, yes. but that's an example. And you need, and you need to get up in, in, in order to, get to shut it down. So that's I, I, I've done a lot of writing about social media, about how much time we spend on screens. So here's an example of how you can use that idea. The idea of the, the clocky is not so much that it's on wheels and that that's a great idea. It's that, as you say, that the, the most disruptive thing to sleep is physical movement. If you can get people to actually get out of bed, that's 90% the way to having them wake up. So that's that's a good idea. But the same is true when you're in a stupor watching TV. You know, you're watching Netflix or you're watching YouTube. It doesn't matter what it is, some video content. And one thing we know is that people binge watch. They spend hours and hours watching. So how do you use Clocky to fix your binge watching? Well, one thing you can do is you can have an alarm clock somewhere else in your house that rings every hour and forces you to get up to stop watching whatever you're watching on the TV if you don't want to be watching for too long. So you just set that alarm the same way as Clocky wakes you up. This alarm wakes you up from watching Netflix for hours at a time. Now, you, you can continue. You keep sleeping after you turn off Clocky. You can keep watching Netflix after you go into the other room and turn off the, the alarm. But, it but is you're much, much less, less likely. likely to. Yes. Exactly. I have a friend who who is a school principal, and he said that he the only thing that he uh, uh, forces uh, his pupils to do, to do is a one mile run at 6 a.m. in the morning. After that, after that, they can sleep. But no one can sleep after one mile running no. in 6 a.m. in the morning. But now there is a joke that uh, I, I didn't invent. It was invented by Tom Lehrer that if you steal from one research, it plagiarizes. If you steal from 10 research, it is research. So the idea is that most research is incremental. So how? what can I do with the idea of being stuck? Do I need to just think, listen, boy, you don't need to be that, rigid, that original. You just need you know, to combine one A with B, like the Dilbert principle, and this will be sufficiently good, and this will get me out of being stuck. The, how do I utilize the, yeah. the concept of originality is overrated? I, so I think I think the mistake is thinking there is such a thing as originality. The, the the version of originality that we hew to, that we think is is real, that represents the best products in the world, the best ideas, the best everything, it doesn't exist. There's there's no such thing. One of the assignments I had to do as an undergrad that changed my view of the whole world was in psychology. There was a thing called the cognitive revolution. I know you've interviewed some people who are associated with that on your your show, and it changed the way humans thought about the human psychology. It changed the way we did psychology. We practiced it, the way we consumed ideas, the way we thought the brain worked and so on. It was very profound. And people called it the revolution because they said it changed everything. You know, paradigm shift, Thomas Kuhn, everything's different. But I, my assignment was to write about how that wasn't true, that it was, it was a recombination of old ideas. And I had to go back and read old traditional psychology from the 30s, the 20s, the 40s, you know, over 100 years ago, and say how this was just building on the it was standing on the shoulder of shoulders of giants, and that actually this wasn't original. It was just a recombination. And I did, and I wrote it, and I thought it was it was a it was a good essay that I wrote because not not because I wrote a good essay. It was a good idea to have that assignment because it showed me that even these things we think of as these very sort of profound shifts are not profound shifts a lot of the time. Or if they are profound, they're still not as profound as we think they are. So my, my lo that's a long way of saying that striving for something truly original is, I think, a fool's errand. You are not going to get there because it just basically doesn't exist. The best thing you can do is to have a product that you're very proud of, but say it's okay if, it, if the building blocks of that product, if the foundations of the product existed before that I can trace the origin, the lineage of that product to something else. That's okay. That doesn't mean you say every combination is good. It has to be a good recombination. So you've still got to scrutinize it carefully. 
But to say it has to be so mind-blowingly different that no one ever thought about it before, you are never going to get anywhere doing that. And uh, if, if you're ever going to approach radical originality, it's going to be after you have 10 recombination ideas, and it's going to take time. So striving for it today is generally not the best path forward. And again, most research done in academia, most products done in the industry are not like this. People tend to think or have the concept of nostalgia that you also mentioned in the book, mm -hmm. that iPhone was a revolutionary idea. But in fact, if you do remember, iPhone is just an iPod touch with a SIM card. And one cannot distinguish between iPod touch and iPhone in the first version. We don't remember iPod touch anymore, but it was the iPod and then the iPod bigger, bigger, bigger. Then we had the iPod touch and then we just had the iPhone which was an incremental uh, uh, thing to the iPod touch. And this is, like, it's very, very, I, I think it's very important. Just had like one, one hour ago, a conversation with one of my graduate students and said, yeah, I want to come with like the paper that will change the world. I said, no, it's right. not going to happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. 